Coming up today on St. Paul Forum, we learn more about a special project that's currently underway at the Halley Q. Brown Center. Welcome to St. Paul Forum. I'm your host, Georgia Ford. I want to thank you for joining us today, and I really hope that you are excited about learning more about St. Paul, specifically the Rondo neighborhood, because today's guest is Don Selly. You are currently the Director of External Affairs and Development at the Halley Q. Brown Center. Welcome. Thank you. And just tell us more about the Halley Q. Brown Center and what exactly your organization does for the community. Well, we are a organization that's been around since 1929. We're 89 years old. We have had two locations. Our first location started out at 553 Aurora, and we were displaced because of the freeway that came through. And our second location that we've been at since the 70s is 270 North Kent Street. And at our location, we have a lot of services from basic needs to last year, we handed out over 700,000 pounds of food wow. to close to 60,000 individuals that came through our doors that were in need. We have a clothing closet. We have educational programs. We take children from six, week, six weeks old until 12 years old. We have senior programs that are some, some fun because you get to hear a lot of stories, computer classes. We have lots of partners in the building from the NAACP to the AALC. You know, so we are here for the community and helping everyone as we started because African Americans didn't have a place to go. And so we've always been, well, we're the second oldest African American organization in the, in the state of Minnesota. Wow. So we've been there to help the community, to help them, whether it was back in the 30s and 40s with the children having places to go every single day of the week from archery classes to dance classes to cooking to um, their parents having programs when community members, community meetings would happen, they would take place at the original Halley location. Nice. Now, Don, you did mention 89 years mm -hmm. of services that mm -hmm. you guys have provided to the community, but uh, leading up to the anniversary of 90 years, you guys have a very special project you're working on. Can you tell us more about it? Yes, we are working on an archive project at Halley. We started this program probably in about 2016 as we had boxes and boxes of papers and photos, and we needed to preserve them. And so we wrote a grant to start working on preserving how do we preserve them. And we started working with Dr. Catherine Squires from the University of Minnesota. And um, she came in, brought in a couple of interns, MNHS, Minnesota Historical Society came in with some interns, and we started going through boxes of photos. And for me, what really made me want this project to move forward is I found a photo and we didn't know who was in the photo. And you have that photo with you too? Yes, Can I do have that, it? yes. I will. So in this photo, you found this photo was, I'm guessing in one of the boxes. Yes. And no one knew the identity of any of these people. No, and I was so, I think I was more hurt and surprised that as tight-knit families and as close as the African-American community is in St. Paul, no one knew who was in the photos. So what we did is we started having luncheons and kind of like get-togethers with people and we started bringing up photos and had seniors looking at the photos and telling us who was in them. Wow. And if you want to see an 85-year-old woman turn into a teenager, show her her long-lost love <laughs> that she hasn't seen and people would get so excited oh. over the photos. But that's what it started with us identifying the photos and we um, received a very special collection from the Taylor family. And Janabelle Taylor was a director and worked at Halley Q. Brown, both locations. And we started out with her collection that they brought into us because people have started bringing their collections in now. And I think it's close to seven, 800 photos. Wow. And it tells the stories. And it coincides with some of the photos and the um, paperwork and items that we had. 
So now tell us more about this photo that at the time you knew nothing about. Have you guys um, unveiled the identity of each individual or are you still working towards that? Well, in this photo, we have received probably about 15 of the people and we know that it was a Krejjafan photo. And the Krejjafan Club was an organization that was started by African-American women and it is the first letter of their first name. And as we know back then, this started in 1927. It was a segregated area. African-Americans couldn't go to certain places. They couldn't have their parties at certain places that other people in the community were. So they started their own club. And that's what, we have multiple photos going all the way through the 80s, from the 1927s all the way through the 80s of their photos. And from what we can tell is, one of the young ladies in the photo was a member of Hallie Q. Brown. Well, a couple of them were. You know, the Brooks, Mr. Brooks is in here from the Brooks funeral home. Oh, wow. The original, and that's a the staple. older, yeah. you know, Mr. Brooks yeah. is in this photo. So we have a lot of people in the community that this is tied to. And when people see photos of their grandparents, their mothers, or the lady that watched them, they get so excited. And what's really great is we get great stories. So what are you guys planning to do with those stories? I know uh, for the 90th anniversary of the Hallie Q. Brown Center, you guys are planning some very special uh, events and activities. How is um, all of this information, all of these photos, all of this history going to be compiled for the community? Well, we are hoping by our 90th that we will have turned our hallways into an interpretive center. We right now have some photos up, but we're getting more of the history behind the photos. We have video screens up with stories, and that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to capture more of the stories and putting the oral history up. We are going to be making um, beautiful banners and posters that will go, go in the hallways, and our goal would to be put the Rondo Avenue map in the hallway, and then you can pull up you know, an address, and there will be that house. Here will be that story. And that's some of the stuff that we are planning to do by our 90th. And also, we will have this hopefully by the spring of next year. All of this will be online so people can go in and see. We have families that bring us this. And a lot of, we have an 85-year-old woman that came in the other day. She was like, how do I find this online? And we helped her. You know, so a lot of it will be accessible, Amazing. and you'll get to hear the stories. So, Don, uh, that is a year from now. Will there be any previews this year that people can partake in? Yes. We will, in August, September, and October, on Wednesday afternoons, we will be opening up the center that people can come in and see the photos. They can come and see some of the trophies. Someone donated to me in 1949. Um, trophy from the Negro Golf League as they, it was segregated then. So we have the, like trophies, we have photos, we have posters, we have books. You know, so all of that will be open for the public to come in and see. What has surprised you most as you've been working on this project? And uh, I'm sure, you've, like you said, you've gotten artifacts, you've gotten photos, different papers. Uh, what's come across your desk that really just made you stop in your, your tracks and say, wow? The stories. You know, um, to hear the stories, sometimes you think as if these stories just happened yesterday when you hear the pain or you hear the happiness, the excitement. You know, um, I've received photos from people and they want to tell you every detail. You know, one of the stories, and it, it, it's, a, it's a good story, but it's, a, it's kind of hard. One of the Red Caps was a member of the Hallie Q. Brown board, and the Red Caps worked, you know, for the train at the depot. And there is the Red Cap room down there. There's a lot of more, um, memorials to them. And their daughters told me the story about how their father was losing his vision. Mm -hmm. And his customer that he saw on a weekly basis came up to him and handed him an envelope and said, read this when you get home. And as he got home, he read the, the letter in the envelope. And what it was is this gentleman was offering for him and his family to go to the Mayo Clinic and he would pay for his treatment. But back then they didn't have a treatment for him. You know, so you get stories like that. Or you get the stories about the, the winter festivals you know, and the girls picking out their dresses and getting ready to be, you know, crown Miss Hallie. You know, that has always been great. Or we had, we have a tea party at Hallie and the tea party was a little hard at first because the ladies wanted to go to the St. Paul Hotel and one of the ladies said to me, you know, 
We weren't welcomed at the St. Paul Hotel. We go there now, but we weren't welcome. You know, we want to have a tea party like our parents would have had. So we've now at the Haliki Brown Community Center, along with Roxanne Battles, host a tea party. And we have a scholarship that goes to a young lady in the African-American community. But at this tea party, we set it up as if, you know, it could be the 30s, the 40s, and we bring out photos. And one of the ladies said to me as I was pouring her tea, she said, Dawn, I'd like to bring you in something that's very valuable to my family. And I was like, sure, what would you like to bring in? She brought in, it is um, her great-great-grandmother's teapot that she received from slavery wow. right before she was freed. You know, they told her to hide it. They put it in a burlap bag and they buried it. You know, and I get to hear these stories and the public needs to hear these stories. You know, they're just wonderful, you know, but, and we have that at Halley. You know, our community members, once they found out we were doing this, they brought in so much that we've gotten volunteers that come in and they just help us fill out the documents, the paperwork, to try us help with that. How do these stories inspire the work that you do? They inspire us, and one of the things that I've said is, my voice now is speaking for the voices that weren't heard. You know, people's stories didn't get told. You know, it's 2018 and we're telling the stories now. You know, so I'm speaking for the people that never got a chance to speak. I have family members that come in and will correct me if I have put an extra E or an I in a name. <laughs> they will correct me because their family, they never got to tell their story, but now we're telling it. And it affects everything that I do because I represent a group of people who are no longer here. So now these stories are being told. They will be available for the public mm -hmm. to come and, and hear and read and experience in mm -hmm. all their glory. Um, starting, you said, in August and September, and then there will be a bigger unveiling next year for the 90th anniversary. I'm, I'm curious to know, you know, a lot of this history focuses on uh, Rondo and how 94 impacted the businesses, how it impacted the families, mm -hmm. how it impacted the schools. And so I'm curious, how, how as an organization do you take history that has been so significant and, and has touched the lives of so many in the African American community and make it so that it's, it's available and relevant to everyone in the community? You know, we've worked really hard with, from Gordon Parks High School, you know, to universities, to different colleges, and we are, everywhere we go, we speak about it from our executive director, Jonathan Palmer, to our custodial staff can tell you about it. We are making it accessible. We want people to be able to come to the center. We want people, they call me, they come in and they look at photos. They will come in and just say, can we get a copy of a photo? I had a gentleman come in one day and I didn't recognize him and I was walking in the hallway and he was really upset. And I was like, sir, can I help you? He goes, I will identify everyone in this photo if you give me a copy of it. My parents are in this photo and I've never seen it before. Mm. And this gentleman's in his 70s. Wow. And I was like, sir, I will get you a real copy of it and mail it to you and thank you. You know, so we are making sure that these stories are told and being brought out into the community. And we have classrooms that come in. We have students that come in from organizations from throughout the United States. What well, we did actually, we had some groups come in from New Jersey and California that came in to look at what we had collected and to hear the stories. You know, as Rondo happened, it's not just exclusive to St. Paul. This happened to over 1,600 black and brown communities throughout the United States. We're just the first community that has made a memorial over it, like with the Rondo Plaza that opened this past weekend. You know, so we have, we tell the story every time we can. You know, and it's interesting to actually look at the demographics of St. Paul now. Mm -hmm. We're a very, very diverse community uh, from the rich Somalian mm -hmm. population, the Hmong population, the Hispanic population. And so, you know, I, I just think about us as a, a whole, as a community, and how understanding this as the history of our community, not just segregating it as the history of 
the black community. Mm -hmm. This is our history. This is St. Paul's history. And in order for us to really move forward and to grow as a united force, we have to understand where we came from in order to really know where we're going. Mm -hmm. You know, the Rondo Plaza opened and what they did that was really unique is they took four new neighbors the Hmong, Somali, and Karen, and Aromo, and they did panels over there talking about their history and how they ended up in St. Paul. I recently found a photo teaming up with Liberty Plaza, and it was bringing the first Hmong children over to the center that were brought mm. to Minnesota, and they were brought to St. Paul. So we have a lot of history. It's just not an African-American it's a lot of history. It's St. Paul's history. Yes. You know, you think about it. Jewish families helped African-American families get homes back then because African-Americans couldn't get, on, they couldn't own homes. They couldn't be on deeds. So people helped their neighbor. They helped their community. It didn't matter what color you were. People helped. And those are the stories that we sometimes forget that I met a judge, an ex-judge, and he said, as he, Caucasian male, older gentleman, he said he went into that neighborhood and he never felt more safe in his life. Mm -hmm. You know, but those are our stories. You know, each neighborhood in St. Paul, I'm sure, has a story. I just happened to come work in the Rondo, you know, Summit University neighborhood. What do you think some of the misconceptions are? I know you mentioned the former judge and him pointing out that he felt, you know, safe in, mm -hmm. in that specific neighborhood. Um, what do you think are some of the misconceptions people have about Rondo or the history of Rondo? I think the biggest thing is that people felt that it wasn't a safe neighborhood. And I've been interviewed before with some of the ladies that were children of Rondo. That was one of the safest neighborhoods. It was truly one of the ones, if you listen to the ladies, they couldn't make it a block if they did something wrong without their parent knew by the, knew by the time they got home. There were no, it wasn't crime. Everyone knew each other. Everybody took care of everybody. If, if your neighbor didn't eat, you weren't eating. So we, they made sure everybody was taken care of. Education, you think the gentlemen that worked, the Pullman Porters and the Red Caps, they got newspapers from other states. They brought them back into the African-American community. They brought them into the churches. People went to church on Sunday. They went to the movies on Saturday. All of that took place in this neighborhood. No, it's 2018. St. Paul has officially elected its first African-American mayor. Mm -hmm. um, listening to the stories of so many who were impacted by Rondo, uh, have they expressed how they feel about the progress that the city has made in electing its first black mayor? Everyone was excited as at Halley, we have two retired groups. We have the Golden Agers that will be turning 80 and the retired men's group who split from the Golden Agers in 1960. The retired men's group, they're 58 years old. Melvin Carter the first senior, I'm gonna say, he was a member of that group. And you gotta realize the Carter family was a part of Rondo. They, this is their heritage. So we had a um, mayoral candidate forum at Halley we had so many people come out to support Melvin, you know, or Mayor Carter, I should say. You know, but he, as he is a child of Rondo, he's a child of Halley, the King Center. He is one of our residents, and people came out to support him and his family. They were so excited. And I don't think that people were so excited just in the African-American community. I think that went across the board, that people were excited to see someone that happened to be black, young, and vibrant, and I think that's what brought them in. For some of the seniors of Rondo, it didn't help that they knew his father and his grandfather. <laughs> Absolutely, and they have a very rich and dynamic history in St. Paul, and so mm -hmm. it's amazing to even hear furthermore how involved they were with Hallie Q. Brown, and I'm sure they're going to be um, active and a part mm -hmm. of the interactive center you guys are working on. Yes, I just met with Commissioner Carter two weeks ago. She came in and we spoke about the history. We are actually writing something about be your father-in-law. So they're very much involved in the city, in the center, and want to help. And speaking of interactive center, I know we touched on it a little bit, but I don't think that term is used a lot, and so I'm kind of curious to know, what does that look like? What is an interactive experience? Well, the center, as we're turning it into an interpretive center, is you will be able to go in 
and not just look at photos, you'll be able to hear things. You'll be able to um, touch some of the artifacts. You know, you'll be able to just really be in that person's footsteps for a little while. One of the things that we're working on that I think will be very interesting, we have a resident that her family's home was taken eminent domain, mm. but it was taken and moved. They lifted the house up and they moved it and sold it to another family that did not look at them for, for, for a certain dollar amount than what they received for the house. And we're going to go back into that house, let her go into her family home that she hasn't been in. So there'll be things that you'll be able to get involved in and to see, you know, and there's papers, the stories. So you'll be able to tell your own oral history. As I tell people all the time, don't think of just Rondo. Think of your own family. Talk to your grandmother. Talk to your great aunt. Talk to your uncle. Talk to, you know, your parents. Get their stories of their childhood. They don't have to be from St. Paul. They can be from anywhere and record those stories. And we want people as they're coming into the center to record their stories. One of the first things that we ask when we're recording these stories, we ask people, tell us your best memory of Hallie. And we get those stories. So we want people to come in and take something home with them. And that would be the best thing is for you to record your own story. We all have cell phones. That's the easiest way to record a story. Absolutely, and Don, as we prepare to wrap things up today, 90 years, or nearly 90 yeah. years, next year will be 90 years, that the Halle Q. Brown Center has been in Rondo. What does it take for an organization to stand that long and to overcome so many obstacles? One thing that is wonderful about us is we, we write grants. We get private donations. Um, the United Way started out as Community Chest. We were one of the first people they ever gave a grant to back then for $1,000, and that's what started us. So we do write grants. We do get private donations. We do, you know, fundraisers, you know, for our food shelf, for, our, you know, our children's programs. So we ask of people to donate funds to us, and we also ask people to donate their time, and sometimes your time is more valuable than money, to come in and help us with the projects that we have working on, like this archive project. You know, we ask people to help us with that, to donate to us. We're 50% self-funded, which is very unique for a nonprofit, where we raise our money by renting out our rooms. So come on over, have a meeting at Halley. We have beautiful spaces, we have beautiful rooms, and that's how we raise a lot of our funds. But you know, you can always go on to our website, it's halleyqbrown.org, you know, and see all the things that we have to offer. You can donate there. You can actually get an application to come in and volunteer from there. Awesome. Well, Don, I appreciate your time this afternoon, and I want to thank you for joining us and sharing with us the rich history of the Rondo community. And thank you all for tuning in. If you would like to find out more information about the Halley Q. Brown Center, you can always visit online at spnn.org. Have a wonderful day.